Alright everybody, welcome back to my live streams here doing Legends of Caladagia artwork. I'm Jason, the creator of the Caladagia universe. And we're continuing our series here working on a Krylon character, Krylin character, for an upcoming short story based on the planet Kalen 5. Um, so let me just kind of zoom out with the GIMP to give you an idea as to what we've been working on. If this is the first time you're joining, you, joining us over here. Joining me as only me by myself, so just me. Um, anyway, so over on the left-hand side here, this is one of my earlier artworks of a Krylon warrior wearing a Phoenix combat system. What I'm working on right now, like I said, is a character now named Alendar. He's going to show up as one of the main characters in a series of upcoming really short stories, which kind of tie in to the Albion campaign that's going on with Legends of Caladagia, which is a tabletop miniature space combat game, as well as Caladagia Fleet Commander, which is a relatively new board game I created that's basically a game of planetary invasion where one player is controlling the Defender, which is the Aragul Empire, and another player is controlling the Surkari, who are the invaders. Now last time when I left off working on this piece of artwork here, I was texturing his kind of survival suit he wears. You can see these hex patterns up and down his suit. And I kind of cheated a little bit. I went and I added some more patterns here to the, um, which would be his right arm as well as one of his legs and his tail, just so I kind of figure out a lot of the details to what's going on. Because fortunately here, with this area of the left on his left arm, as well as his right leg, I'm going to be able to demonstrate pretty much all the different techniques you need to use to create this type of texturing in the GIMP. And I am running the GIMP version, I believe it is 2.8.6, yep, 2.8.6, and I am working on a Microsoft Surface Pro second generation. All right, so before I dive into this, I kind of got into a little bit of the ideas behind why this texture works the way it does and why you actually see the hexagonal pattern last time on my live stream, but I want to go into a little bit more detail about this process. So I've set up a new test image over here. And what I'm going to show here is kind of a one aspect of how human vision and human interpretation of vision works. Because your brain actually uses all sorts of different visual cues to make sense of what it's looking at. And one of the things it does is that based on adjacent changes in contrast of values, it's going to perceive changes in elevation. So let me show you here. Let me start by taking a fairly neutral gray value. In fact, I'm going to take just your basic middle gray value. And let's just drop a whole bunch of it down in the middle. And up in the upper right hand corner of the screen, we've got a light source. Now your brain kind of knows that's where the light's coming from for this particular picture. And what you can do let me actually, I'll use the acrylic brush, see how it works. We're gonna, I'm going to take a somewhat lighter area and kind of draw it kind of perpendicular to the, the light as it's coming in, like that. And then let's take an area that's a little bit darker than the base color and draw it right next to the lighter color. And when you're looking at this, because you know the light's coming from this direction, your brain kind of interprets that as a bit of a hill. You're going to see, because what it's going to do is it's going to take the areas that are lighter colored and it's going to kind of make the assumption that that's an area that's kind of coming out of the canvas towards you. And then it's going to take the areas which are darker because it's going to assume that those are in a shadow and it's going to, your brain's going to think that that's an area that's kind of sloping into the canvas or below the canvas. It's basically, it's an area of the ground that's going away from you. And because of that, your brain interprets this particular collection of contrast to be a hill. Now if we reverse the order and put the darker side first, your brain is actually going to interpret that one to be a value, or not a value, a valley. Because in a valley, the sloping shadow side first is actually the one that's closer to the light source, where the bright rising back up side of the valley is the one that's actually further away just because it's hitting most of the light coming from the light source. So your brain is going to actually interpret that area assuming it knows the light source up in the upper right hand corner to be a valley. And the reason I said assuming is your brain doesn't always know where the light source is coming from when you have a very few small examples like this. 
and you actually kind of get what a kind of little bit of magic eye going on where your brain doesn't really know exactly how to interpret the image you got to give it eventually by the time you get your final artwork a lot of cues as to where the actual light source is coming from you don't need to actually show the light source whether it's a star a lamp a sun whatever it is you just got to give enough consistent cues as to where the light source would be coming from and your brain's going to start interpreting the actual texture patterns correctly and some of the other things you can do along this line I've got the lighter side selected we can go ahead and draw kind of a wavy lighter line like that Let's do a shadow line on the opposite side. And now your brain's going to interpret that as a plateau because you got land coming up, flat land, which is neutral color, basically neutral value to the area, the rest of the area around it. And then dark color is a shadow area falling back down. Vice versa, same kind of a thing. Let's go up here and draw kind of like a circular ish shadow area. Take a lighter color, draw a circular-ish lighter color, and you more or less, it's, it's a little tough to see here, but that's, that kind of thing is going to create a crater. Just like how your valley was dark first and light, a crater is the same thing, because it's, it's basically a circular value, a circular valley essentially. So those are the ways you can use texture to create, or those are the ways you can use value contrast to create the appearance of texture. And that's all I'm doing here with these hexagons. Now I'm going to show you some tools and how I create that. So let's start with going ahead and creating the texture on the left arm over here. Now last time I had created this hex texture layer. I'm going to bring it up. It's literally just a giant hex texture. And I'm going to duplicate it and we're going to call this left arm texture. And as you're watching this, if you have any questions about what I'm doing, feel free to ask away in the chat room. Or if you just want to ask me random things about whether it's Caladagia, whether it's like to run a tabletop gaming company, or just talk general wargaming, go right ahead. Ask me anything. I'll, I'll probably answer just about anything you want to. I'm dead serious about that, too. Okay, so let's hide the original texture layer. And let's scale the left texture layer here down quite a bit. We want to kind of scale it down to where the hexes are approximately the same size as the rest of the body. That's pretty close. Now what I want to do is apply that lens distort filter because I'm going to give it a bit of a curved shape because obviously his arm being a biological entity with muscles and such and such it has a bit of a curved shape to it now it's important to note that this texture only has to give the hint that there's a curved shape there the actual definition in the telling your brain that's a curved shape is going to come later with light and shadow so right now it's just getting a hint that it's curved and one thing to note about the lens distortion filter I'm going to use I'm going to go to filter um, distorts lens distortion. I'm going to do that in just a moment actually click on it. There's two things. It actually likes to have a relatively circular area to work with. So if you try to do a long rectangle it doesn't work. So if we want to actually create a, a rectangular shaped object like for example the arm or later on down here in the leg what I'm going to do is do a lens distort on just a relatively squarish part of this particular hex pattern and then I'm going to kind of copy and paste that along to get it to the right shape and right size. Now one thing you're going to notice when you go to filters, distort, um, lens distortion, you have a little preview window here but because of the fact you have a hex pattern it's very difficult to tell what it's doing so unless you really know how this tool works it's pretty hard to do. So what I'm going to do, let's just go ahead and duplicate the layer one more time Choose a nice bright blue color. Let's select a rectangle that's about the size of the layer. And we want to paste in the blue color. Make sure you choose full, fill hole selection over here in the tools. And now, let's go select none to make sure we're back in the entire layer. Filters, distort, lens distortion. And we're going to be able to see now what is actually happening. So I'm just going to crank up both main and edge. Everything else looks good. I don't need to change the center position because it looks good enough to me. 
and we can hit OK. Okay, that's looking pretty good there for that lens distortion. Let's repeat it. And I think what I'll probably end up doing is let's repeat it three times. So I know now I can use these same settings I just did to, with this demo blue rectangle and you apply the same settings three times to the layer underneath it. And that's how I can get around the fact that the preview window is totally useless for a very hex mesh pattern. So let's just delete this layer I just created. Let's go back to our left arm texture filters. And I can really just hit repeat lens distortion three times. And I want to move this into the right place. I'm going to select the move tool here, which is a little cross with the arrows on it. And here's a really nice tip with the move tool. By default, it only selects like whatever layer you're over that's got pixels. So you, you can try to move this hex mesh right now, but if I were to click in between the hex mesh, see it's moving like the arm and not the hex mesh, which is really annoying. But what you can do, you go over to our tool options, which is the little volume control looking things. And under tool toggle, select move the active layer. Now no matter where you click, you can drag the active layer around without having to try to play hunt and click on the pixel. Because that wasn't fun 15 years ago with those weird RPG games that were all like, you know, live action things. It's still not fun now. All right. Let's go ahead and, hmm, yeah, we can just, hmm. I'll just like try to size. Is that the shape I'm going for? That's. That's yeah, pretty good. Let's go ahead and copy paste it. Except then go layer to new layer. I'm intentionally making new layers, so I'm gonna kinda overlap them a little bit to kind of clean things up. But you'll see I'll do that in a minute. Paste, layer to new layer. And what I'm gonna do here is actually rotate it a little bit. So let's use the rotation tool which is right up here with the little two boxes looking like they're kind of rotating with little circular arrows. And let's click then on the layer. And one thing I'm going to do is there's this little kind of circular crosshairs thing. This is the center of rotation for the particular operation you're doing. So I'm going to drag it up to a little bit above the elbow because that's where I'd, I would want to rotate it at. And I'm going to then rotate it like that. So it's going to make the, oops, that's too much. It rotates that a little bit and then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of keep doing a little bit of a rotation thing. Let's see if I can pull this off. So I'm going to select less of the layer. Hmm, this might not do exactly what I want, but we'll find out. It might start separating things. Yes, it is going to do that. So instead, what I'm going to do Yeah, screw it. I'll be honest with you. I was trying to get fancy right there, but it honestly isn't necessary for what I'm going to do. So, okay. Before we merge all these layers together, um, what I want to do is start cleaning up where the hex mesh overlaps. And I want to keep the top layer, not the bottom layer, because the bottom layer has a lot more lens distortion to it at the bottom than the top layer has at the top. So it'll look better to keep the top layer. I just had a lot of stuff there, but you'll see what happens. Okay, select the circular brush, go to the layer below the top layer, and just kind of, oh, too big, <laughs> zoom in and start deleting that mesh underneath where they overlap. That'll work good enough. And we're going to do the same thing then on the original left arm texture. It's not perfect, but it'll work for now. Like I said, it's just about getting the hints that there's some sort of texture going on there. It's going to be the big light and shadow we add later that really gives the idea that his arm is circular and where the muscles are. And we do have one more set of texture to apply because he has his hand sticking out across his chest right here. If you're wondering, I guess, why there's a big missing part to his arm, he does have a shield weapon, that not a weapon, but a shield that he carries, and it's this giant bracer thing that emits a shield. Um, let me turn on the sketch. You can see it there, this red area. So that area is actually going to be covered up by a piece of armor, so I'm not bothering to draw the arm there. All right, let's duplicate this layer. Move the active layer 
Is it fit over the hand? Oh, well, okay. I'm just going to scale it to be a little bit bigger cheat, because cheating is always fine when you're doing artwork. Seriously, I'm dead serious about that. As long as you're not stealing other people's artwork and doing little tips and tactics to make things better, cheating like that is fine. Just trust me. All right. Now we got to merge all these layers together. So right click on the top layer, merge down, keep doing that. Make sure you don't, oh crap. <laughs> don't do what I just did there. I merged it down to the wrong layer. Um, let's drag the layer to right above the proper layer, which is left arm texture, and then merge down. Now we can check to make sure we did it right. Let's hide the left arm texture, and there we go. And I hit it and reshowed it, and everything disappeared, so we got everything good to go. This is where I pull out that wonderful emboss tool that I talked about last time that'll turn it into the um, core texture thing. And basically what the emboss tool does, if you think back to the little demo I did a few minutes ago with the whole light and dark thing, the emboss tool will literally take these shapes and create the light and dark sides to it. But before I do that, I forgot, I need to actually muddy up the texture a little bit. So take the airbrush, get one of the acrylic brushes out, too much, let's add a little bit of jitter to it. The jitter makes the brush kind of jump around as, you, as you're drawing. This is going to add some extra texture to the arm, that's all, nothing exciting. If I zoom in over here, you can kind of see how each of the hexes is, is really uneven. That's the effect, that's going to have the effect of, or the end result of what you just did is going to produce that particular type of effect. Okay, so what time did I start? About 9.50ish, I think. So I'll probably go to about 10.45 or so, and we'll call it a, uh, a day, or I'll call it a night then. All right, filters. Distorts, emboss. I'm trying to remember my old settings. Asimov, Azimuth, not, not the author, was like 60. Elevation is 45. I think depth I had down to like 13 or 12. Uh, exact numbers don't matter a whole lot, but you know. But now, as before, what this does is it creates. An elevation map, assuming that as the value gets brighter, it's further off the canvas. Of course, these are hex things. These hex um, texture is actually implanted in the suit, not raised above. So let's go colors, invert. And now you notice what it's going to do is make the darker textures closer to the light source, which for this artwork is upper right-hand corner of the picture. And the lighter colors are the ones that are further away from the light source. Let's go to change the layer mode to hard light, which hard light, once again, I talked about that last time, but you know, it compares the value to the middle gray value. Anything, basically, any value that's lower than middle gray darkens that, what's below it. Anything lighter than middle gray lightens what's below it. So it's a great way to take an embossed terrain map like this and turn it into a texture. Of course, it didn't really do much because the fact that the values right now are so blown out that it didn't look like it did anything, but I'm going to show you what, how to fix that. So go to Colors, Levels, and down under Output Levels, we're going to adjust what essentially is defined as white. So when you actually have the white color, what color should you be outputting is what's happening. I'm going to put this pretty low down to about 132, 135. And then same thing with this black level. What I'm doing is pretty much defining what color is actually black, which I want to put it kind of close to gray. Not a lot, but kind of. Let's actually bump up the white level a little bit. And you should start to see the texture appear. Like I said, once again, this is kind of that whole funny magic eye thing where you kind of have to look at it the right way. You kind of have to stare at it and convince your brain as to what's actually where the light source is. But now that I've got so much texture down, it's going to start being pretty obvious as to where the texture is. But there we go. I just kind of have his arm bent a funny way with that texture, but... 
I'll try to fix that at, when I get to the later on. Hope I can fix it. If not, honestly, you're probably never going to notice in the final artwork. <laughs> it's my hope anyway. Okay. So, I like what, where it's looking right now. Let's hit OK. And then if I want to, I can make some final adjustment, adjustments by changing the opacity of the texture layer. And what I'm going to do here is kind of compare the texture on the hand to what I see on the body and make it look oh, pretty similar. It doesn't have to be perfect, just pretty similar. That looks pretty good. All right. I want to find our arms color. And I'm going to select now the arms layer. I drew them by themselves just for this reason. I'm going to select kind of an empty area. Yep, there we go. So I selected an empty area of that particular layer, which effectively selects all the null space, or where there's nothing, there's no color on that layer. And it almost selects the entire empty space. We kind of got this little fuzzy border region. Let's go select grow by two pixels, which will make it pretty much grow the selection to include everything up to the area that's basically everything that's not pure solid color on that layer. Let's go back to left arm texture. Edit cut. And just like that, you deleted all the texture that was outside the shape of the layer, which is just what you wanted to do. All right. We're going to do this one more time with the leg. But there's going to be one more neat little trick going on down here that's kind of important. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn on a layer I created before. It's called Guide. And I'm going to draw a red line. And I'll explain what that lead, that lead, what that red line represents here in just a minute. It's somewhere, it's probably where I'm right. Still, it's still jitter on, but I don't want jitter on. Turn jitter off. Let's define it like that. Okay, so what this red line here means, it's a perspective thing. If you think about it, how he's um, currently running, let me bring up his side view of him. You can see over here, from our perspective, this is the leg I'm, I'm looking at right now. Uh, it's fine. I draw here. Okay, this is the leg I'm looking at. And then below the red line is this kind of double knee jointed section going on here. Now from our perspective, you actually can't see this chunk of the leg right here. You can pretty much see where this, where the quadriceps ends, and then it kind of picks up a little bit further down the middle knee joint here as to what you can see. The reason that's important is the texture obviously would not continue across that line. So even though the pixels on either side are adjacent visually from our perspective, in reality the pixels on the opposite side of that red line are not actually adjacent to each other in real physical space. So we need to make sure that there's a clear break in the texture there to give additional illusion that what you're looking at is pretty much part of his leg is being hitted by his quadricep. So let's start working on that. We can, let's keep the guide up for now. We can hide the sketch. Text, text texture layer. Let's duplicate it one more time just in case you want to use it again later. This is right leg. Same deal, let's just um, go ahead and size it on down. Still too big, that's fine. Just kind of keep scaling it down until you get to the right size. Alrighty, we can probably just use the same settings for the lens distort that we use for the arm because it's 
Like I said, it's an approximate thing. Obviously, the leg's bigger and blah, 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 but it's an approximate thing. We could probably just do two lens distorts instead of three, right? Lens distort one, layer, not layer, filters, repeat lens distortion. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Um, what I'm going to do differently this time, to kind of get rid of this um, distortion you see at the top, and the bottom of the texture because I don't really want that. Let's just take this area and just work with a much smaller area like, oh, let's do that and that. So it minimizes the distortion at the top and the bottom of, let's see, we should probably do that. There we go. So now it minimizes the distortion at the top and the bottom. We'll still keep in a little bit of distortion on the left and right. Not a lot, but just like I said, you don't need a lot. This is only just giving you the hint that there's something going on here, some a round shape. So let's do select invert and then delete. There's delete. Once again, I'm on my $5 keyboard I got from Micro Center where the delete button's down by the arrow keys for whatever reason. There we go. Let's duplicate our layer. And we're gonna do the same kind of train thing where we keep just going on on down. We'll overlap it a little bit, then we'll clean it up in a minute. And here's where we want to make sure we have a very clean, obvious break. So what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is kind of do that, where I kind of put this layer intentionally halfway between the previous layer, so that way for sure we'll get some kind of a clean break going. And I could probably even move it a little bit over to the side. I really want to make sure there is definitely a clean break here. Where you can really see. I keep using. I do that a lot. We use the same phrase over and over again. But regardless. Uh, where you can definitely see that it's two different parts of the leg. Yeah, it'll work. Not a whole lot of, of curvature going on there, but it'll be good enough. We can change that a little bit if I wanted to, but like I said, it honestly isn't that big of a deal. This is one of those very small texture things. Okay. Let's start cleaning stuff up here. Let's go back to our texture copy. Get our eraser with the circle out. Select none. <laughs> like, wait a minute, why is nothing happening? Oops, too much. The wrong section, actually. Close enough. Oh, we're close enough. And we're just going to keep doing this process of cleaning up the joints as necessary. And then we get to this one. This is the fun one. So, okay, this is the one where we have the break between the quadricep and further down in the leg. Um, we want to remove it pretty much right around that line, that red line that I drew. All right, 
Then for the layer below it, that up a little bit shoot okay I screwed up I erased the wrong I had the wrong lit the, the wrong layer selected Okay, let's do this the right way. Um, I want to... So this layer here, I want to remove everything outside the line. There we go. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, I... I I erased the wrong layer last time. Oops. But okay, we're good there. All right. Now this layer, no, not that one, this one. I want to remove everything that's inside the red line. You'll see how it looks just in a minute here. There shouldn't really be any over anything overlapping. If there is, then that's not good. Now, of course, this boundary is going to be defined more later on with shadow and light. But for now, this is just working with the texture. And finally, let's clean up down here. Hide the guide, and let's see what we're dealing with here. There we go. Yep. So that's kind of what we're going for. Um, you can see a broken, a breaking the texture right here. That's exactly what we want. Like I said, we need to later on emphasize the fact there's a break there, but this is just a start. It's all applying to hint that there's more texture, or hint that there's a texture going on here. Excellent. Let's merge everything down. Merge down, merge down, merge down, and finally merge down. Filters, distort. Oh, no, before I do that, jumping ahead of myself again. Let's kind of uglify the texture a little bit. A little bit of jitter. Now I go filter, distort, emboss. Same process, color. Invert. Let's go change the layer mode to hard light. Oh, uh, image. No, not image. Color. Levels. We're going to drop the white level down to somewhere in the 130s. We'll bring the dark level up. Probably your. Uh, one thing you probably want to do when you're dealing with a valley setting like this is you really want to make the dark levels be more pronounced than the light levels. It's just part of the whole way of telling your brain which way the texture is actually going. 
by emphasizing the dark over the light, it's going to think more valley-like. By emphasizing the light over the dark, it's going to think more mountain-like. You can see here, it's not quite the same. It looks brighter than the rest of the body. So that's not good. Let's drop the lighter color down. Increase the darks. And you're going to see how the dark in your eyes is going to start taking over and it's going to look more and more like the areas around it. All right, that's good. I like that. And then we can just adjust the opacity of that layer a little bit to match the rest of the body. And I do need to clean up just a little bit up here where the leg is meeting the uh, torso area. And finally, just like we did before, let's find our basic suit color. Click outside of it. This is our suit color, suit color layer. We're going to click outside of it. Go select, grow, two pixels. Therefore, we only have, pretty much have all the negative space selected. Let's jump back over to our right leg texture layer, edit cut, and it's going to remove all the texture outside of the leg. All right. Whew. <laughs> that was a process. So it's 10th. Oops, I bumped the microphone. It's going to be obnoxious. Sorry. Okay, it's about 10.30. Let's go for another 15, 20 minutes here. And I'm going to start working on his armored suit section. So let me bring up the sketch. And I need to put that. We'll put that on the very top right now so you can kind of see what I'm working with here. And what I'm going to do is make some of it kind of facing towards the light, some of it facing away from the light. And some of it inset a little bit, so we're gonna get a little bit of details going on here. Hmm. And what I'm gonna do first is essentially create what I'm gonna call a face mask. I'm probably just making that up myself, but I'm gonna identify where the different faces of this vest are because the fact that it's mostly heavily angled, it's very sharp changes in light and shadow depending on how things are hitting it. And later on when we start applying the light and the shadow to it, it's going to be very sharp changes and very soft changes. Um, but more about that later when we get to light and shadow. So let me think a little bit about the different faces here. And the other thing I'm going to do with this particular vest is it's more or less symmetrical because we're pretty much looking on at him dead on. So I'm going to draw one half of it, just flip it over and keep the other half that way so we got pretty close to being um, symmetrical. Oh, but there's one thing we have to do. No, we don't have to do that, actually. We're good. Um, what I was thinking, oh, actually we do. Here's the problem we run into, right? There's this area of the vest down here. Um, it's actually below the left arm. The reason why this is a problem is also there's an area of the vest up here that's above the left arm. So the layer has to be simultaneously below the left arm and above the left arm, which you really, I mean, you could do that with masking and tracing around and things, but it's not fun. So what I'm actually going to do instead is select the arms layer, and I'm going to just simply copy out the hand here, the left hand that's over the, the torso, do cut, edit, paste, layer to new layer. And I'm going to put that just above the arms layer. So now the left arm is in two pieces. And we can then go ahead and stick the vest layer in between those two layers. So select the arms layer, create a new layer of the vest. And I'm going to start de defining the shape of this vest. And I'm using the lasso tool to create nice straight edges to define the various shapes of the faces. Now the lasso tool can be used to draw all sorts of freehand things like that. But it can also, if you just click, pick up, click, pick up, click, pick up, click, pick up, and so on, 
it can actually create a very nice well-defined polygon none and that's what I'm going to be doing right now so I'm creating the first polygon of a suit we're actually going to call this layer um, the vest face mask and I'm going to start painting it in these different colors to identify the various shapes of the mask You can always adjust the shapes later if they don't look in the right perspective or whatever it may be. And a random mathematical thing, apparently if you have like a um, layout like this where you basically got a bunch of polygons next to each other. It only takes four colors to be able to paint a collection of polygons such that no two adjacent polygons have the same color. Totally random, I know. But chances are if you're into science fiction you probably like random math stuff like that. Oops, that's the, the GIMP does that a lot of them on the Surface Pro. Um, I don't quite select the tool, so I think I select it. Then I go to do something, and it's actually the old tool. It's like, ah, total disaster. Select, please. Remember what I said about four colors in math? Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I thought I was right. Now I gotta, now I gotta look that up and figure out what I thought I was talking about. So if I were to draw this down here, I'm now bordering all four colors. Hmm. Okay. I clearly got something wrong in my head. I'll have to, I'll sort it out later. Maybe next time, if I have time, I'll tell you what I was thinking. Or what I meant to be saying, or what I got, I don't know. I'll figure it out later, but clearly I'm wrong about something.
So if you have to jump in the last two or three minutes as to what I'm doing here, I'm creating what I call a face mask, where I'm pretty much identifying the different faces that, compi that compose this guy's vest area, just because when we get to the light and shadow part later, it's going to help make it a lot easier to figure out where the sharp angles are in terms of figuring out how the light is interacting with his vest. And it's kind of a weird, funky shaped thing because you know it's science fiction and that's how science fiction works even though it's a ridiculously stupid idea. Um, seriously, have you ever tried to cosplay a sci-fi guy? They don't really work very well. <laughs> that was the um, a Tau Firewire from Warhammer 40,000 for Yomacon this year. and Yeah, those things are not easy to build as real costumes because they can kind of get away with things that are tabletop miniatures that don't exactly work quite quite right in the real costume. But I'll keep working at it and make it better each year because it's fun to do. I love cosplay. Alrighty. Let's see what I got going on here. Oh, actually one more thing I need to color in down here. Oh, close enough. <laughs> I'm going to deal with this arm thing later. I guess we can go ahead and do the vest part down here as well. Hide the sketch and see how it's looking. All right, so that's the shape of his vest at the moment. I'm gonna fix some of the areas just very carefully. Oh, sketch right now. I'm the right thing. Like that. There we go. Oh, it's texting your guy. What's going on? Okay, edit. Uh, select none. I'm using the smudge tool right now to kind of fix some of the areas where there's like a white space. Uh, you want to be careful with this. You don't want to make it too smudgy, just enough to fix it. So if it's too smudgy, it's going to be hard to get a nice sharp edge when it comes later on the whole light thing I was talking about later. But, you know, I'm kind of just discussing far off stuff that hopefully you just understand what I'm doing right now and it'll make sense later. Okay, let's select our vest. No. Copy, edit, paste, layer, transform, flipped horizontally. And see what happens. Now, of course, the artwork kind of, um, I'm sure his body is not perfectly symmetrical for, symmetrical for any number of reasons, so it's not going to go perfect. Undo rectangular select, layer, anchor layer. All right, so how do we want to fix this? So what we've got here are a few things going on. Um, one, his shoulder sticks out above the shoulder over there, probably because his shoulder is a little bit broader. The bicep starts at a slightly different spot, clearly. And this is a mess in the middle. <laughs> 
Okay, let's start with the fixing the shoulder problem. Let's go back to our arms layer, take an eraser. Problem solved. Then select the void of the arms layer. Select grow to pixels. Let's see, this is our right arm texture, which would be just called arm texture. And cut to get rid of that. Select none. We'll clean up that stuff later. The arm texture later. I guess the arm texture, we can drag so the arm texture layer. Let's drag that between the arms and the face. No, I just got to watch. Let's undo that. Oh, well, it's fine. We can do that one there. Um, problem is left arm texture has both the hand and the left arm texture to it. So I'm just going to go to the left arm texture layer and delete this texture where it overlaps his um, suit. That should be easier to do. Okay, let's fix this this empty space here in the middle. So vest face mask. So just taking the paintbrush, selecting the color that we need to fill in the gap with, and we're filling in the gap. With a round, I think it's the full 100 hardness brush. There we go, that'll work. So you can see the kind of a complex shape structure, complex shape structure he has going on here with his vest. All right, let's just for the final step tonight, I'm just gonna give it a basic coat of light gray. And I think we'll end it there tonight. So I'm gonna create a new layer above the, the vest face mask. We're just gonna call it vest face color. And all I'm really going to do, take a lighter, medium gray color, probably around the 60 value mark. And literally just scribble. And that's his vest. <laughs> just kidding. Let's go back to the vest face mask. Same thing we did before with the texture. Select by color, select outside. We don't need to grow the selection this time because we have a fairly sharp mask below it. So let's go back to the base color, edit cut, and there we go. That is gonna be pretty much our vest color for now. We're gonna add some texture to it and start working on some of the shadows and highlights next time. But once again, I'm Jason, the creator of the Caladagia universe. For more information on Legends of Caladagia or how to purchase a copy of either the Miniatures game or Fleet Commander, which is the board game, you can head over to Caladagia.com. And let me just write that down here because, once again, it's a made-up word. And I'm going to continue this artwork for um, the Kalen 5 short story. It doesn't actually have a name yet. But hopefully the story will be out probably late December to early January. And I'll definitely talk about it here on the stream as I move on to something else in the future. So once again, thanks for watching. I'm Jason, and have a good night.